Church, good morning. It is uh, Wednesday, a few days after Sunday's message. We had some technical difficulties. That's why we're here this morning. I am in my office and we get to talk about Luke 16, the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. So turn your Bibles there. We're going to do a redo of the message. Uh, unfortunately, I don't get to see you. You don't get to, well, I guess you get to see me, but uh, this is good to revisit the word and be encouraged by it. Miss seeing so many of your faces. We love you. We're praying for you. Uh, but today we get to look at this parable, which is a very intriguing parable. There's a lot of insightful things that we get to discuss uh, in it. And uh, in a way, Jesus is going to transport us to a, uh, a different realm and remind us of ultimately what's important. And uh, boy, I tell you what, these are the days that we need to be transported to another place, a higher place, a more exciting place to remind us that this world is not all there is. And how we live now greatly determines how we view eternity, what our lives are going to be like in eternity. And I don't want to ever want us to look back and think that, um, boy, we could have done so much more for eternal uh, eternally significant things. And so we turn to Luke 16. Uh, I was thinking about uh, the story last week I read of Yo-Yo Ma, a famous cellist who was in getting his vaccination in, I think it was a California gymnasium at a high school, and he was getting his second vaccination. And uh, as he was waiting after the vaccination for about 15, 20 minutes, you know, so there's no side effects, he pulled out his cello and started playing in this gymnasium. And just a silence fell over the place. And People were crying because they were listening to something so beautiful, so moving, and uh, and uh, what an impactful moment, right? Because we've all been dealing with some just crazy stuff over the past year, and uh, to be transported to another place, to be removed from this this uh, world of difficulties and trials, uh, to hear something beautiful, boy, that just moves us. And this is kind of like what Jesus is going to share with us this morning. So turn your Bibles, if you would. And uh, he's talking about wealth and money again. But again, when we talk about wealth and money, which again is one of my favorite topics, it's it's never about how much, it's never about the amount. Uh, it's always about the heart. And it's always about not what God wants from us, but what he wants for us. And so many times we try to find our identity in things other than God. And I think that's really at the heart of this, this parable. Um, money is to be used for eternally significant things. It's to be used to glorify God. It's to be used to, to bless others. And oftentimes we, we lose track of that. I remember the Wall Street Journal years ago giving a definition of money. Now, this is interesting, right? The Wall Street Journal defining money this way. It is an article which may be used as a universal passport to everywhere except heaven and as a universal provider for everything except happiness. Now, this is the Wall Street Journal talking about you cannot get to heaven with money and you cannot be happy with money, which seems so counter our culture and everything we tend to value and everything we tend to espouse. And so uh, Jesus is right in line with, with the, these thoughts and saying what you do with your money and how you perceive your wealth greatly uh, not only impacts eternity, but it also helps you figure out what your true identity is. Your identity is not found in money. It is not found in what you possess. Luke 12 talks about this. Does your life not consist of more than what you own and what you have and what you treasure? Your life consists primarily of understanding your identity with a holy God who loves you and has given himself for you so that you can be in relationship to him. So Luke chapter 16 is where we're going to be. Look at verses 19 through 31. Let's, let's read them. And then I want to go back and I want to make four points from this, this passage. So there's a certain man and he habitually dressed in purple and fine linen, gaily living in splendor every single day. And a certain poor man named Lazarus was laid at his gate covered with sores and he was longing to be fed with the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. And even the dogs were there coming to this poor man, Lazarus, and licking his sores. It came about that the poor man died and was carried away by the angels to Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, this rich man lifted up his eyes, being in torment, and saw Abraham far away and Lazarus at his bosom. And he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool off my tongue, for I am in agony in this flame. But Abraham said, child, remember that during your life you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus received bad things, but now he is being comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between us is a 
fixed chasm, a great chasm that's fixed in order that those who wish to come over from here to there may not be able to, and those may not come over from where you're at to us. He said, then I beg you, Father, that you send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers there, and they need to be warned lest they come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they're, they're going to repent. And he said, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone rises from the dead. And I'm praying that God puts his eternal truths in our hearts at this time. So there's four things I want us to look at and really the abuse of, of money and possessions, uh, because this ultimately teaches us that there's going to be eternal loss and there's going to be eternal glory. And what we live for here on earth is going to determine that loss and that glory. And Jesus is talking more about more than just about wealth. He's talking about identity, those things that we value, those things we tend to put a lot of trust in. And so the first point I, point I want us to see is this, that there's a great battle where we are trying to find identity in this life, in this world. Uh, I get to talk about this uh, this week with some, uh, some high school students. Who is man? Uh, what is our purpose? What is our significance? Where do we find our identity? And we see two characters here. One is unnamed. He's the rich man. And we, one who is named the poor man who is Lazarus. And we're going to talk about why uh, the naming and the not naming is important. But let's talk about the, the rich man first. He's given no name because he has no name apart from his wealth. He's just a rich man. And so everyone who, who sees him knows he's wealthy. He's rich. He has everything he needs. He's, he's, he's just stinking, stinking rich. And I would say that if you're to kind of put him in a classification, Roman chic is his kind of vibe. He wears expensive European underwear. He feasts daily. His philosophy and probably the bumper sticker on his chariot read uh, party time all the time. And so here's this guy who doesn't have a name. He's not necessarily investing in his, his character and the deep things of integrity in his soul. He's just a rich man. And uh, he obviously lives in extravagance and, and splendor. And there's this poor man, Lazarus, who's laid at his gate. And the rich man probably just steps over him every single time. And so uh, gives no regard to the, to the poor man, uh, helps, doesn't help the poor man at all, even though the poor man is laid at his gates every single day. So here's this rich man, and that's all he is. He's a rich man. He's nothing. He's built his life on his wealth. And once his wealth's gone, he's gone. Once we put our identity in things, once those things disappear, uh, there's really no you left. And so Jesus is, is concerned about people who put, put so much emphasis on stuff and striving after possessions that that's not your true identity. And then he, he tells us about the, the poor man named Lazarus. He's given a name. And Lazarus, his name literally means God is my help. And I think this tells us something about his soul that even though he lacks he has God, so therefore he has everything. Um, I'm only speculating here, but there's probably a sense of contentment that even though he goes daily without food and daily without clothing and daily without shelter and whatever he may need, he has God. And so somehow his faith is built. It is a great faith because he's not relying on stuff of this world to satisfy him and bring him contentment. He has God. And so his name communicates a lot. Though he's unrecognized by people, though he is stepped over by the rich man, probably on a regular basis, the person and fate of Lazarus is known by God. And this brings Lazarus great comfort. Even though Lazarus had nothing, he had himself. He had a name. He had a relationship with God. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is more than we could ever, ever want for or desire or need. See, Jesus says that if you build yourself on anything but God, you really don't have a self. And so Lazarus has a name. He has a self. He has an identity in God. Even though he may lack what the world deems as wealth and possessions and treasure, he has more than most people who have everything, and that is he has God. And so Jesus is saying, here's this poor man named Lazarus. He's, he's daily laid at the gate. Literally, that word laid is he's thrown or dumped, almost like the, someone doesn't have a time to slow down the chariot and just says, all right, just get out and, and do your daily routine of begging and wanting and desiring. And he's given no attention 
by the rich man or maybe even the rich man's friends, but he's given attention by these filthy mangy dogs who just come and, and lick his sores and what it, what it just a sad, sad state of affairs. And so while the rich man grabs everything but Jesus, the poor man has nothing but Jesus because for the poor man, his greatest treasure is Jesus and he desires nothing else ultimately. And so there's two things I think that we need to understand when it comes to the battle, uh, the great battle in this life where we are continually tempted to try to find our identity and in stuff, possessions, wealth, riches, uh, relationships, sex, jobs, career, hobbies, that ultimately I think God wants us to continue to, the, to experience the drastic deliverance from the love of things. We need to, we need to realize that we need to get rid of the, the love for uh, attention and um, uh, wealth and hobbies and luxuries and all those things. And that one of the works of God is that he continues to drastically deliver us from the love of stuff. We're never to limit our, our financial dreams to this life. When it comes to wealth, we're looking to, to separate our affections from, from wealth so that we use them to glorify God and, and use them for the good of others. We're supposed to spend our lives pursuing things with eternity in view. I'm sure the rich man lived by the law of reciprocity, meaning he used his wealth as a way of, of ledger keeping so that when he did something good for somebody, uh, they could do something good for him in return, which if he sees the rich man, the rich man, uh, he can't do anything uh, in return for the rich man's, you know, toward the rich man's wealth. And so therefore the rich man ignored him. And we are not to live by the law of reciprocity. We only do things for people that can pay us back. Jesus says, don't do that. You're to live by the law of generosity, right? This is not about the amount. This is about the heart behind what you do. And, and the heart says you do things for the glory of God and the good of others. This is communicated to us in James chapter two. This is communicated to us in first John chapter three. And so he calls us to, to not pursue this, this life of utter emptiness, chasing things. We're to be rich in good works. We're to be rich in glorifying God. We're to be rich in being generous toward others. So God continues to work in all of our hearts by reminding us that he wants to deliver us from the, the love of things, but he also wants to do a second thing. He wants us to continue to cultivate this deep delight in the service of others. See, the Christian approach to life is that we should invest our lives in the good of others and glorify God. If you have money, be generous. If, if you've been shown mercy, show mercy. If you've been uh, forgiving, you forgive. And so the, the, the Christian, the one who loves Jesus, um, is, is generous with it, all they have. And it doesn't matter what you get in return. Your contentment is just being the person and being obedient to the God uh, that has saved you and loved you. Uh, we've been to, I went to India several years ago with a team. And boy, I tell you what, talk about people who have this, this newfound freedom in Christ and this, this separation from the love of things. There's these, in this remote village, we were working with this pastor and these people live, boy, 50 bucks a month to support their family. And they were so zealous for the works of Jesus. And they're riding mopeds through the jungles and hiking through these snake infested jungles to take the gospel to these, to these villages. And we went to the house of this pastor and literally it was probably a 20, 200 square foot home. 10 feet by 20 feet, two rooms, one room where the whole family slept. And I think there were five of them. And then one room where they prepared their meals and the wife was out there preparing this, this Indian meal. And I, and I love Indian food and I can just smell the spices. And our in-country host said that the meal she was preparing for our team literally was probably worth two weeks worth of wages. And she was just smiling and she was so happy to prepare this meal for us even though it may have meant them going without for a number of days themselves, their heart of generosity was, was so moving and so impactful. Um, she wasn't doing it grudgingly. You know, I didn't know, I didn't hear any uh, uh, curse words. I didn't hear her mumbling under her breath. I just saw this smile and this, this glow and this radiance saying she wanted to, to take something that was of so, so much value to them and they wanted to give it to us. Like I said, their newfound freedom to worship God openly and, and the fact that they need Jesus and the fact, the, the fact of the matter that they, they, what they lacked material materially didn't matter. They wanted to bless 
us and honor God and glorify him. What an amazing, amazing testimony. These are people who have found their identity not in wealth or material objects, but they have found their wealth in Jesus. Second point we see is, so we have the rich man, we have Lazarus. We have the great leveler then that happens in verse 22. They both die. And, and the reality of it is this, whether you're rich or poor, we all have a common, common end of our lives where we're all going to meet death. This is the great leveler, the great equalizer. Uh, the reality of it is everyone dies. Um, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. And, you know, some people will retire. Some people are going to have kids, but every single person is going to die. And there's nothing like it. it. It unites us all. It strips us all bare. And, and death takes everyone, regardless of social status, regardless of wealth. And so here's the rich man who ate so well and probably his cholesterol caught up to him, uh, eating too many steak dinners and, and he dies and his obituary probably read, you know, here it is, three lines. He wore imported underwear, he had lots of fun, and he died. And it's kind of humbling if you think about, like, someone's obituary like that. I'm just making that up. But uh, how humbling and how empty and how silly it sounds that here's a man who amassed so much wealth for himself and probably a reputation among town. But in the end, you can sum up his life with he wore fancy clothes, he ate fancy dinners, and he died. And so he's buried, and it says, if you look at verse 22, he died and was buried. We don't have that for Lazarus. It just says that he died and was escorted away by the angels to Abraham's side. But for the rich man, he died and was buried because for the burial of a rich man, this was a, this was a celebration. This was an impressive um, show of, of wealth and extravagance. Everyone was there. The mourning was impactful. It was loud. Um, oftentimes they hired professional mourners. And so here's this guy who's buried in his extravagant clothes and he probably has this opulent tomb and uh, he's rewarded by, by, by the earth, by, by people of this world. But, the La but Lazarus didn't have a burial. It says he was died and escorted away. Why? Because a poor man couldn't afford a burial, a proper burial. Matter of fact, no one... Maybe he was even aware of his death and his body was taken probably to a, a heap where he, it was burned. There was no ceremony. There's no pomp. There's no circumstance. And so he was forgetful to everyone except God, the God who, who cares and the God who provides and the God who sees. See, Lazarus dies and then he experiences a, a heavenly escort. Think about this. From Earth's viewpoint, the rich man was a success, but the poor man had this regrettable existence. See, from heaven's viewpoint, the celebration is just beginning, not for the rich man, because he had his celebration on Earth. But now the celebration begins for the one whose heart was content in Christ. From heaven's viewpoint, the true riches of what ultimately matters is now going to be revealed. So, Death is fixed. There's nothing we can do about it. It's the reality that we're all going to experience. And there's no mulligans. There's no second chances. There's no purgatory. Now we get to look at these two fixed locations in eternity, which now brings us to our third point, And that's this, the great reversal. How the kingdom of God is now and will ultimately reverse all the things we thought important. The, the, the foolish things of this world are now going to be shown to be wise. The wise things of this world are now going to be shown to be foolishness when eternity happens. And all the things that we live for that the world values are going to be shown to be valueless. And the things that the world has had an incredible disregard toward and disdain toward are going to be shown to be incredibly worthy and valuable. So the great reversal, point number three, identity in, etern in eternity. So the two men pass through death's portal and an amazing reversal occurs. Now Lazarus is in and the rich man is out. Now the, 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 the poor man is rich and the rich man is poor. And it's the ultimate spiritual heavenly rags to riches story, even though even uh, the, the destinies are, are the prize, right? The, the thing that these men had been living for um, is going to be shown to be their, their, their true value. So Lazarus, who, mind you, in this entire parable, never says a word. 
He doesn't, he doesn't complain or blame God. We see no, um, no, no evidence of that. And in heaven, he doesn't gloat or refuse to be an errand boy to this rich man who's, who's still in eternity is demanding Lazarus to, to serve him. And there's just this godly regal silence that Lazarus has where he's got this confidence in God. He's got this contentment in Christ and it pays off to trust God because now he experiences this escort, escort to, to everlasting joy. And it says he's placed at Abraham's side. And this is awesome because you're given a place of, of honor to be at someone's side was to be in the, in the seat of honor, the place of the most intimacy, the most uh, comfort, the most uh, feasting. Um, people would clamor to be by the, the host's side. And it says that Lazarus is given the seat of honor. So you can be poor in this life and be rewarded greatly by God in the next. And it's cool that the Bible says that, that, that Lazarus is carried away to Abraham's side, like this personal angelic escort, like you've suffered on earth. You've had these trials on earth. Now you're going to give the, you're going to be given this position of honor at Abraham's side. And, and Abraham being this, this father, um, this patriarch uh, that the, that the Jewish people uh, respected and regarded, you're given this place in, in what we would know as, as heaven, this place of, of pleasure and satisfaction and joy. Lazarus gets the, the best seat. He's given the royal treatment. And it's cool to, to think about that everything is being put in its right place, which God will ultimately do. He will, he will right every wrong. He will deal with every injustice. Um, you don't have to fight for yourself in the sense that God will make everything right. He will avenge. Uh, justice is his, says the Lord. Vengeance is his, says the Lord. Uh, the battle belongs to him. He sees what's going on in your life and he's going to take care of you. And so here he is at, at the side of, of Abraham and he's rewarded and relieved of all of his lifetime suffering. And he's now given delights and pleasures in the presence of God. And it's permanent. Your eternal home is permanent and nothing can ever, ever change it. And so Jesus shows us here that it's okay to have uh, financial dream, dreams, but make sure you're rich in eternity. Here's a man who was poor on earth, but he was rich in faith. But then there's the, the rich man who's now in eternal torment. He had earthly pleasure, but he lived for that and failed to cultivate a spirit toward God. And now he's experiencing earthly torment. And we have to understand that where our faith uh, is placed determines our destiny. You know, if you believe in the Son of God, you have eternal life. And if you obey the words of the Son of Man, it just confirms that eternal life. And this is what John 3, 36 says. See, the, the, the rich man, ha he, he knew of God, but he didn't take time on earth to cultivate that relationship with God. And so he ended up being spiritually empty. Yes, he was materially rich, but he was spiritually poor. And now there exists a, a canyon, a gulf, a chasm between, between him and, and Lazarus, between him and, and Abraham. Um, really, this is the picture of, of heaven and hell. And this chasm is fixed. It's permanent. And, and see, on earth, we, we have, we have this, this idea that there's no distance between the rich and the poor, the clean and the unclean, the righteous and the unrighteous. And, and, and we have always uh, before us opportunities to bless people and to help people and to love people. But one day there, there's not going to be those, those acts of mercy and those acts of kindness and generosity. The rich man had opportunities to help and he didn't. And you know what, you guys, we, we live lives where there's need all around us and there's opportunities to show mercy and God wants us to act on those things. We don't need to pray about it. We don't need to overthink it. So many times we justify ourselves out of acts of mercy. You don't need to form a committee to bless somebody and, and to love somebody and to be generous towards somebody. You don't need to call the Pope and get a papal blessing. You don't need to call Pastor Scott. Hey, Pastor Scott, is this okay? Just do it. We are to be reckless in how we show mercy and we're to be uh, liberal in how we show generosity. And so 
don't be selfish, be selfless. I'm thinking of this famous parable called the parable of the long spoons, where it shows a picture of heaven and hell. And there's a common, common thing that exists in heaven and hell, and it's, and it's called the long spoon. And in heaven, what they've realized is that with these long spoons, they could not feed themselves. So what they've had to learn to be in heaven is in order to live is that you take the long spoon and you feed others. But hell is a place where there are long spoons and people have not learned to feed each other. They continue to try to feed themselves and yet they can't because the length of the spoon they, and, they, and they ultimately are starving because they haven't learned to be selfless. Hell is selfishness. Heaven is selflessness. And this is the message that God wants us to understand that Heaven is a place of joy and acceptance. Uh, lo- it's, 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 a, it's, it's the joy of love and acceptance. And, um, and it's going to be worth it. When we live for heaven now and, and just giving all we can because we, have, we live in light of, uh, of eternity, um, we realize that God is going to replace all the things that we've sacrificed for his name with just this unending experience of love and acceptance. And it's going to be joyful. Second Corinthians chapter four, uh, Paul says that, you know, this momentary light affliction is nothing compared to the eternal weight of glory. The outer man is decaying, but the inner man is being renewed day, day by day. So Paul's saying, cultivate the inner life of who you are and be reminded that this world is passing away and there's, there's eternity that's coming. And no matter what you may be suffering and no matter what trials you may be, in, may, may be enduring, it It's all going to be so, so minute compared to what God has waiting for you in glory. Uh, There's a famous um, woman named St. Teresa of Avila, and she said, all of our discomforts and trials of, of this world, when they're all added up, will amount to nothing more than just like one bad night at a, at a really bad hotel. And that's awesome. I love that perspective. The the quote says, in light of heaven, the worst suffering on earth will be seen to be no more serious than one night in an inconvenient hotel. God can turn a lifetime of suffering into an eternity of blessing. So the rich man is now in torment. And it's obvious that the rich man knew Lazarus. He calls him by name. He says, hey, tell Lazarus, and, and again, here's how selfish this man is. He knows Lazarus's name, didn't help him on earth, and now in eternity still expects Lazarus to be his, his errand boy, right? Hey, tell, tell Lazarus to come down here and just give me a drop of water, right? Hey, tell Lazarus to go and, and tell my family that uh, they don't want to come to this place, and, and the rich man just hasn't wrapped his mind around, and nor will he now be able to because he's in eternity separated from God's love and and God's joy. Hell is a fixed place. Heaven is a fixed place. And that's why this this rich man is now experiencing the torment of isolation and abandonment. That's what hell is. It is everlasting torment of isolation and abandonment. There's no, you know, I'm going to go to hell and all my friends are going to be there and we're going to have a party for eternity. No, no, no. There is no recognition of friendship. There is no recognition of of a party atmosphere. You are alone, you are isolated, and you are utterly abandoned. The word torment is used four times in this passage. And and this man is not rich anymore. Eternity has now been shown to be the great reversal of the things that we have value. And and it's it's not because he's rich that he's in hell. And it's not because Lazarus was poor that he's in heaven. The reason the rich man is in hell is because he neglected a relationship with God. He didn't take his spirituality seriously. I know men and women who are materially wealthy, who are rich in faith toward God. They know how to leverage what God has entrusted to them for for eternity, for the glory of God, for the good of others. But the rich man is is in hell because he found his identity in his riches and he had no time for God. And now he rich, wishes the opposite was true. See, a selfish life is a rootless life. For everything uh, it yields withers and fades. You can't take anything with you. All the cars and the clothes and the, and the houses. The, the, the rich man is now in this new kind of country club where the dues are permanent. 
And those dues that he's going to pay for eternity is isolation and abandonment. And so he trusted in all the wrong things. He trusted in idols that would leave uh, you empty, leave you in despair. And trusting Jesus, which, the, the, which Lazarus did, when you trust Jesus, it will always provide an eternal and secure identity that is going to be full of hope and love and, and faith. And so the rich man can't even get a drop of water. And secondly, he realizes that, well, I need to go warn others of this place. And so he says, Abraham, send Lazarus to go warn my family. You know, it's the first time we have this idea of, of selflessness, right? Like he's thinking of others is more important than himself. Like if I can't be helped, he, he reasons, maybe I can help my family. So um, instead of being self-absorbed, he says, go warn my family. And this brings us to our last point. And I want to close with this, that the great miracle exists that now we can have identity in, in Jesus. Eternity is coming, ladies and gentlemen. Our destiny will ultimately be fixed. Will we spend eternity in heaven with God or will we spend eternity in hell apart from God? And so these two men are experiencing what is coming for everybody. And the, the determiner of where you'll spend eternity is not how much money you have, how little money you have, it's if you have Jesus. And here's the great miracle that God has told us everything we need to know about eternity, how to be saved, how to have faith, how to love God, how to love our, our neighbor. See, the moral of the story that, that Jesus is getting at is that where God's word is open and it's read and it's embraced by, by those who are willing to hear, there's no eternal fear only eternal restoration of all that was missed out on this in this life. And that's what, that's what the kingdom of God does through the person work of Jesus. It's, it's restoring, it's healing, it's, it's preparing our lives for eternity with him. And so um, the rich man says, send, send Lazarus because they're going to, they're going to believe someone risen from the dead and they're going to be warned. And, and Abraham says, I'm not going to send him because they have the Bible and the Bible is all you need to know that eternity is going to come and that the kingdom of God is breaking into this world and the kingdom of God is worth living for. And ultimately the author and, and perfecter of your faith is Jesus. And if you don't have Jesus, you don't have eternal life. See, people want miracles. They want, they want these spectacular moments of, of the miraculous and Faith that is based on that kind of activity is not saving faith. They're not going to believe a rich man, a, a man risen from the dead. They have the scriptures. Matter of fact, up to this point, Jesus has already raised a couple people from the dead. He's he's uh, he's raised the the woman's son from the dead. He's raised his friend Lazarus from the dead, and ultimately he is going to be raised from the dead. Jesus himself, and nothing else is going to convince people that they need Jesus and that they need to have eternal life in him. See, the problem is not a lack of evidence. The problem is the power of unbelief in a person's heart. I remember you probably have heard me talk about my grandfather who, boy, when we debated, he was a staunch atheist until he died. And he would continually say to me, I want Jesus to come here right now and tell me that he exists, that God is real, that he ra was raised from the dead. And I just had to say to him, I had, I had to say to him, Grandpa, even though you want that, even if Jesus appeared right now, you still wouldn't believe because the evidence is already there. He's already done this. The problem is not lack of evidence, Grandpa. The problem is that you have a hard heart and that even if Jesus was standing here right in front of you, you still wouldn't believe. And that's humbling and that's sobering. And, and we need to realize that people don't need anything more than what has already been given. We have the Bible and we have a risen savior. And so ladies and gentlemen, Christ is the answer. Here's the great miracle. This is how much God loves us. This is how, how rich we can be. This is not about what we may have in a material way. This is who we may know in a spiritual way. And that is the question, do you have Jesus? 
I was right. I was reminded of the movie uh, Dead Poet Society, which I love. I love Robin Williams. And if you remember the the famous phrase from Dead Poet Society is carpe diem, right? Seize the day. And here's this professor played by Robin Williams who who takes these, he's at an all boys school and he takes the students down to this, this hall where there's trophies and awards and these pictures of, of people who have died, who are part of the school's history. And, you know, we're talking hundred year old pictures of these, these young men who um, Williams character says, what would they say to us today? And, and so Robin Williams encourages the students to lean in closer to the glass and look at these pictures. And all of a sudden he whispers over the boy's shoulders, carpe diem. And a couple of the students turn around like, this is a little creepy. This is a weird, right? And they're looking at the faces of all these men who lived so long ago, who are now dead. What are they saying to you? What would be the message they would want you to know? Now in this movie, it's not a spiritual movie. All that Williams wants them to think about is carpe diem, seize the day. Live for today. Live for the here and now. Right, you're not guaranteed tomorrow, but but seize this day, and so it says carpe diem, carpe diem, and I wonder, like all the men and women who have gone and died and are in eternity, what would they say to us? And I think every single person, whether they're in heaven or hell, is saying, "Trust Jesus, trust Jesus." Those in heaven, with a smile on their face and joy in their hearts, are saying, "Trust Jesus, it's worth it." And those who are in hell are saying the same thing, but they're saying as as a an out of grief, and they're saying it out of mourning, and they're saying it out of loss. Trust Jesus. See, they were here, and they had the opportunity, and they didn't cultivate a life towards God, and now they're suffering eternity apart from His love and His grace and His mercy. And so, the great miracle is this: God has not left us empty. He has not left us without direction. He has not left us ultimately poor. He wants to make us rich. But the treasure is not material treasure. The treasure is Jesus. And so will you trust him today? Will you find your identity in Jesus? Will you be restored to God so that while this world is fading away, and and though the outer man is, is, is decaying, is the inner person of you being built up in Christ? And are you preparing yourself for your eternal eternal home where you will be seated at Jesus's side, where you will be given eternal joy and comfort and feasting and intimacy and be given a place of honor because of your relationship with God? Or will you continue to pursue a life, pursuing material wealth, pursuing material riches, pursuing a personal reputation that if separated from God won't matter one bit. Trust Jesus today. Find your identity in him. Church, I love you. So thankful for you. I'm praying for you. Let's pray now. Father, thank you for giving us the message from from the passage, this parable. There's so many wonderful truths to think about. Thank you that you not have not left us empty, but you've given us the greatest, greatest gift anyone could ever receive, and that's eternal life. Thank you for forgiveness of sins. Thank you for restoration of relationship. Thank you, thank you for making us spiritually rich. Help us cultivate those riches we have in Christ so that we prepare our hearts, our souls for eternity. And as we're doing that, may we glorify you as we show others the way and help bless people, not just in word, but also in deed, so that they may have an eternal home with you as well. Thank you, Father, for loving us, for all that we have in Jesus. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Love you, church. Thankful for you. Have an awesome day. We'll see you Sunday. Godspeed. Bye-bye.